Today, after 16 months of preaching through Romans, we reach the last chapter. I think it's entirely safe to say... Um, there you go, Dimitri, I'll throw that down there. I think it's entirely safe to say that uh, there is no other letter in the history of humanity that has done as much to change the world as Paul's letter to the Romans. And yet there's something incredibly strange uh, about that because Paul really hasn't told us what to do. I mean, there really is no real practical application point, at least not so far. I used to love to listen to Chuck Swindoll, and at the end of every sermon, he would have this practical application point, you know, like write your mom a note or join a small group or go on the mission trip or eat your vegetables, something like that. In the 80s, uh, church growth was always the rage. It was the rage. So we were always taught to end every sermon with a practical application point. And yet time and time again, I get to the end of the text in Scripture and realize there wasn't really anything there. I'd have to make something up. And then I realized that people really wanted me to make something up. In Romans, Paul has primarily just told us the way things are. In other words, he's announced the decision of God. And when he mentions our decisions, well, it's just not all that practical. For instance, Romans 6, 12. Remember, he wrote this. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body. And we think, okay, that's great. He's going to give us a list of sins. But when we translated that literally, we realized that he wrote, let not the sin reign in your mortal body. And we learned that the sin has something to do with how we relate uh, to this tree in the garden sanctuary of our own soul and really every human soul. Romans 12, 1, he, he, he wrote this, present your bodies a sacrifice. <laughs> but that's hardly practical, right? He seems to make a list in chapter 12, but when we translated that literally, we discovered that it really wasn't a prescription, but more of a description. In 12, 14, he does write, Bless those who persecute you. That's just a command. Do that. Bless those who, who persecute you. That's kind of practical, but you need someone to persecute you. In 1221, he writes, overcome evil with good. But what does that mean? Don't we need more knowledge of good and evil in order to know how to use the good in order to overcome the evil? But more knowledge of good and evil, that sounds vaguely evil, right? In 13.7, we got our first truly practical application point. I mean, this is a very clear one. Do you remember what it was? I'll quote. Pay your taxes. That's it. 13.13, 13, he does say, walk properly, not in orgies or drunkenness. But then we wonder, okay, well, is that two beers, three beers, four beers? How do we judge? 14 verse 13, he writes, let us not judge. And yet that is exactly what practical application points are, are good for, right? That's where they're so helpful. I mean, I can, I can do them and then I can judge myself to be righteous and maybe judge somebody else to be unrighteous. Judge not is an entirely impractical practical application point. So you see what I mean? Apart from pay your taxes, there are no solid practical application points in the book of Romans until now. Until now, for at the end of our text today, the last chapter of Romans, I think Paul actually does give us a command that's relatively clear, a command to do something that you can do and then have a fairly good idea that you have done it, and yet I don't know of any churches in America today that actually do it, that which Paul commands us to do. Anyway, chapter 16. Now, at first, chapter 16 may appear kind of boring. But it's really not so boring once you realize that you're reading somebody else's mail. Okay, so keep that in mind. 16 verse 1, Paul writes, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant, diakonos, a deacon, of the church at Concrea, that's the eastern harbor of, of Corinth, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, a way worthy of 
the holy ones. That's what saints means. What way would that be? Well, anyway, help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron, a prostatus of many and of myself as well. So Phoebe is a prostatus, which means that she supports Paul and others probably financially and also um, in terms of like management. So she's like Paul's manager, he's saying. And she's a deacon, which is really fascinating because in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul tells Timothy that a deacon should be the husband of one wife, and Phoebe probably doesn't have a wife. She's from Corinth, from whence apparently Paul's writing to the Romans. Now Corinth, as you may know, was like the Las Vegas of the ancient world. It was said that there were a thousand prostitutes that lived on the mountain on the south of town the, where they uh, served at the temple to Aphrodite. Prostitute is pornace in Greek. It's where we get our word pornography. But they didn't have photographs or movies in Paul's day, but they did have a lot of paintings and statues, and, well, Paul doesn't even mention them. Abortion, infanticide, that was common in Paul's day, particularly in Corinth, but Paul gives no practical advice about legislation or political action. It was to Corinth that Paul had written a few years before in regard to a man sleeping with his father's wife and then bragging about it. And of course, that's, I mean, that's helpful, right? Don't do that. Don't, don't sleep with your mom like that. But you see, there's a whole lot of gray between sex with your mother and walking past a, a statue. So when Jesus said stuff about not looking at a woman, or some think it should be translated a wife, uh, with, with, with lust, well, did that include statues? See, it would be nice if Paul had given a little more direction in that regard. And you see, this is what people want from pastors. I know this. Practical application points. Like no R-rated movies, no Greek statues, no kissing in church. And that makes perfect sense. Because sexual abu abuse is, is rampant in our culture. It's rampant in Denver. Like it was rampant in Corinth and, and Rome. And something, something should be done about it. We want moral direction. We want political advice. 146 B.C., this was, I was reading about this, in response to a revolt, a Roman general had exterminated all the men in Corinth and sold the women and children into slavery. And now Paul is writing to Rome and sending this letter with Sister Phoebe, a Corinthian from Corinth. I'm just pointing out that there were incredible ethical and political tensions in in Corinth and in Rome, just like there are incredible tensions in our society today. And now Paul is writing to Rome, sending this letter from uh, Corinth. And be nice if there was some practical advice on how to address all those tensions, right? And to all to address all of our tensions. Uh, next verse, number three. Greet Prissa, Priscilla, and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila, uh, he had, Paul had met in Corinth. You can read about that in Acts chapter 18. Now they're back in Rome. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, that's a female Hebrew name, that's interesting, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, that means they're probably Jews. Greet Andronicus and Junia, and my, my, fellow, my kinsmen and fellow prisoners. They are well known, literally notable, uh, in or among the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. And that's fascinating because Junia is a female name. And Paul seems to be saying rather clearly that she was an apostle. And not just any old apostle, because apostle means messenger, but she appears to have been commissioned by Jesus himself and commissioned before Paul was commissioned on the road to Damascus, like one of the 500 that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. In the Middle Ages, church leaders began arguing that Junia was short for Junian, which is a masculine name, because they could not abide a female apostle. 
And you see, that's understandable considering that to the Corinthians and to Timothy, Paul had written some rather confusing directions about women in leadership. But here in Romans, Junia appears to be an apostle. Priscilla has a church in her house and her name is listed before her, her husband, um, uh, Aquila. And Phoebe is a deacon in Corinth of all places, which seems to imply that Paul was speaking to some specific situations in Timothy and 1 Corinthians, and he didn't expect folks to like just read his mail hundreds of years later and create a bunch of rules. And he did know that the Romans would be reading his mail because he was sending it to them. And still, Paul gives no practical instruction on how to run a church. I was ordained in two Presbyterian denominations, and we had hundreds of thousands of pages of detailed instructions on exactly how to run a church. We spent countless hours arguing over policies, procedures, our stance on abortion, sexual ethics, political issues, and most importantly, who we would judge in and who we would judge out of our institutions, and Paul has done none of that in Romans. Paul continues, greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord, greet Urbanus, our fellow work in Christ, and my beloved Stachys, greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family, the household of Aristobulus. Now, that's really fascinating because there's a good chance that Aristobulus was the brother of Herod Agrippa and the grandson of Herod the Great. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord uh, Trephena, that's a feminine name, and Trephosa, that's a feminine name. Greet the beloved Persis, that's a feminine name, who, who has worked hard in the Lord. Now, this is kind of interesting, but the only people that Paul has mentioned that have worked hard in the Lord are females. Make of that what you will. Next verse, greet Rufus. Chosen in the Lord. From Mark 15, this is so cool, we learn that this Rufus was likely the son of Simon the Cyrene, who carried the cross with Jesus. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Isn't that a juicy tidbit? That means that Paul probably called this lady um, mom. <laughs> Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, uh, Julia, and Narius and his sister and Olympus and all the saints who are with them. So far, Paul has mentioned 10 women and 19 men. Some are Jews, some are Romans, some, some are Greeks. Some appear to be upper class. Most appear to have names that were associated with uh, common folks or slaves. There had to have been ethical, political, and ecclesiastical tensions, but Paul gives them no real practical direction regarding church government, public morality, or politics. No practical application points other than pay your taxes. And yet, he did just command all of them to do something. He did say greet in the imperative tense, 16 times greet. But what does he mean by greet? Next verse, this is the practical application point. This is that place where the rubber meets the road. This encapsulates the theology of St. Paul in Romans, and this is the very thing that we American Christians very rarely do. Verse 16, greet one another, with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. And we think, well, surely he didn't mean that. Right? That's kind of like an anomaly to the book of Romans. It must have been a meaningless gesture, you know, for them, common. And it would be awkward for us and dangerous, dangerous. Well, I think he actually meant it. First Thessalonians ends with this uh, statement. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. All of them. It, right now, holy kiss each other. That's the way Paul ends the letter to the Thessalonians. 
1 Corinthians 16, 20, after long sections on sexual improprieties in Corinth, Paul writes, greet one another with a holy kiss. 2 Corinthians 13, 12, greet one another with a holy kiss. We tend to think holy means without feeling. But Peter tells us what holy means when he ends 1 Peter with the same admonition using different words. 1 Peter 5, 14, greet one another with the kiss of love. Now, Peter doesn't use the word eros. He's not talking about erotic kisses. He uses the word agape. But agape does not mean without feeling, but just the opposite. God's agape. And God is holy. And if you haven't noticed, God has feelings. In Luke 7, Jesus, 30 years old and single, is at a formal dinner with a Pharisee when a woman most likely a prostitute. She interrupts this banquet by like falling at Jesus' feet, washing them with her tears and covering them with kisses. When Simon the Pharisee grows indignant at this, Jesus reprimands him for not being more like her. You gave me no kiss, says Jesus. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss, catafileo, like super kiss, my feet. Now, we don't know whether or not Simon kissed other rabbis that would come to his home for dinner, but we know that he would never ever have kissed anyone the way the woman kissed Jesus. She loved, she agaped much. So there may have been some social conventions around kissing rabbis. Scholars debate this and possibly family members, but nothing analogous to the kissing commands of the New Testament. According to the highly respected Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary, and now I quote, there is general agreement that the holy kiss had its origin in the practice which emerged in the early church among the believers themselves, with the impetus probably coming from the shape of their life with Jesus himself. Nothing analogous to it is to be found among any Greco-Roman societies, nor indeed at Qumran. That's, you know, the Jewish communities from whence we get the Dead Sea Scrolls and a whole bunch of list of rules about social life. So, yes, the holy kiss was clearly an accepted practice in the early church. And, yes, it would have felt awkward for Gentiles and Jews and yes, it does seem to be dangerous. By the third century, the holy kiss was no longer allowed between genders, and religious leaders began warning of its dangers. In the 13th century in Britain, now it makes sense that this happened in Britain, they stopped kissing people and substituted a kissing tablet called an osculatorium, which was then used throughout the Roman church as a substitute for, for people. In Latin, I think it was called the pox. Uh, an antiseptic kissing tablet. No, no lie. Today, in many Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches, the clergy, in obedience to Paul's command, literally do the kissing for you. It's part of the liturgy that the pastors kiss each other. They do it for you. Which is better than most Protestant evangelical churches where most just never kiss, and if you do, someone will call the police. And I totally get that, because I worked in two churches in California where the senior pastors were cheating on their wives with a host of church ladies, ladies in the church, and, and one of them was even hitting on the teenage girls in my youth group. And so I want to say, if you think anyone on staff or in the congregation of the sanctuary has kissed you in an inappropriate, in an inappropriate way, I'm, I'm begging you to tell me. And if it's me that you think that about, I'm begging you to tell the church board. Sirius has a heart attack about that, okay? But now having said that, Romans 16, verse 20, writing from Corinth, the Las Vegas of the ancient world, riddled with sexual licentiousness and abuse, writing to Rome, the Washington, D.C. of the ancient world, riddled with more scandal than Vegas and Corinth and D.C. combined, Paul commands the Romans to, quote, greet one another with a holy kiss. Why? 
Why a kiss? There are entire scholarly works on this very question, and nobody knows. Because Paul doesn't tell us. Paul kind of reminds me of my dad when I was a little boy. You know, my dad, he would just get frustrated with me and my two little sisters and one more argument. And you, I remember he just turned to me and said, Peter, kiss your sister. It definitely was not erotic. And yet I can tell you that when I actually did kiss my sister, something happened. Why a kiss? Well, maybe because our dad is quite a kisser. You know, Jesus told a story about our dad, who's also his dad, and the power of his kisses. We were all made with a kiss. Our father breathed his breath into dust, and Adam, mankind, became a living nephesh, a soul, a psyche. We were made with a kiss. And we're still being made with kisses. So Jesus told the story about a father and a prodigal son. You know the story, but you may not have noticed that the story pivots on the power of the father's kiss. It's actually the story of two sons, but it begins with the youngest son coming to his father and demanding his share of the inheritance. In that day, that was equivalent to the son saying, Dad, you're dead to me, and I want your stuff. Remarkably, this father gives the boy what he apparently, what he thinks he desires. The boy travels to a far country where he squanders everything on profligate living, that is, unholy kisses. In the words of his older brother, prostitutes. Once entirely destitute, living in a pig pen somewhere, this desperate boy comes up with a plan that some people tend to think is righteous. But if you read the story carefully, I think the story that Jesus told is saying that, no, this is the pinnacle of unrighteousness. For the boy decides to return to his father because he knows that his father is still rich. He practices a speech in which he confesses his sins and then asks to be a hired servant. So that's the speech that he pla that he plans. He, he, he maps out the speech. He, he wants to be a hired servant. That is an employee, not a son, an employee who works for his father's stuff. Well, from a distance, this father sees his son coming down the road. He runs to him on the road where he falls upon the boy's neck. And, and before the boy can get a word in edgewise, the father cataphylacin. It's the same word that's used for that woman that Jesus feet. She, he just starts kissing his son, kisses and kisses and kisses his son. And at that point, that boy must have surrendered to his father's kisses. For when the boy delivers his prearranged speech, he, he leaves out the last line in which he planned to plead with his father to hire him as an employee. You see, he no longer wants to be an employee. He has a new desire. He wants to be a son. Romans 2.4, it's the kindness of God that leads you to repentance. And so the father heals his boy of all the wounds inflicted by all those unholy kisses with just a river of holy kisses. And everyone starts to party. Everyone starts to party except the older brother. We discover that he believes that he's earned all his kisses. And so he's offended by the river of free kisses lavished upon his little brother. And yet kisses that are earned or bought or paid for are the very definition of unholy kisses, right? That's the definition of porneia. That's the prostitution of the human soul. If you think you've earned your kisses... You cannot receive holy kisses. In fact, they'll burn you. Well, the story ends with the father standing in the outer darkness with his older boy whispering to him, Son, you're always with me. And everything that I have is yours. 
But you see, the older brother does not want the younger brother or his father's kisses. When my dad used to drop me off, you know, seventh grade at junior high, he would always give me a kiss, and I'd wipe it off. Why? Because I was trying to be proud. Seventh grade. Well, this father goes to the outer darkness with his self-righteous son. His presence undoubtedly burns like a fire, but now we know what it is that he wants. The Father wants each of us to receive his holy kiss and then kiss our sister, kiss our brother. He wants us to greet each other with his holy kiss. And now you think that I'm going to make you kiss each other, right? And I'm not. But maybe God is. You got a Bible? Read it. I mean, what do you think it means? He doesn't tell us why we must do it. He just tells us to do it. But I do suspect that he would like us to, you know, ponder a bit. So here are some of my observations about kisses. Number one, kisses are communion. So right now, pucker up. Just pucker up. Don't worry. Just do it. Go like this. Go do that. Now turn and look at someone near you. It's kind of freaky, isn't it? It's kind of creepy. Between those two tender membranes that we call lips passes what Paul has informed us in Romans chapter 8 is life, spirit. It flows in and out of the earthen vessel that is your neighbor. Wind, breath, spirit, they're all one word in Greek and in Hebrew. When my dad told me to kiss my sister, and I actually did kiss my sister, I think my, ha my heart had to acknowledge that in some amazing way she was me and me was she. And the same spirit was in each one of us. Two, two bags of dust that came from the same pile of dirt. When I became a dad, I was surprised to discover that I seriously, I just couldn't not kiss my kids. Whether they were clean or dirty, good or bad. And when they were bad, you know, they would often refuse my kisses. But I'd just wait till they fall asleep. And then I'd walk in and quietly kiss them on the cheek as they slept. According to Paul in Romans 13, we're all asleep. But I bet that all along our father's been sneaking in and kissing us quietly in our sleep. And yet, according to Paul, it's time to wake up. And God wakes us with a kiss, a kiss that shatters our self-centered dreams and reveals the presence of love who's been with us all along. Number two, kisses make us vulnerable. When the father ran to his boy and covered him with kisses, he made himself vulnerable to incredible pain. And yet the father had always been vulnerable and I would imagine had always offered his son those very same kisses. The father had always been vulnerable, but the boy had never been so vulnerable as he was that day out on the road. All of his arrogant dreams of, you know, a life without his father, they had been shattered by the realities of the far country. And now his father's kisses revealed that his judgment of his father's kisses had just been part of his own arrogant dreams. He could never, ever earn his father's kisses. But even more, his father never ever desired such a thing because all of his kisses are 100% grace. They're holy. Number three, kisses are dangerous. Not just unholy kisses, but holy kisses. It was dangerous for the father to con commune with his prodigal son in such an extravagant and unguarded way. It cost him. It had cost him already, and now it cost him a reem, a robe, at least a fatted calf. It cost him, and, and it was dangerous for the boy, or I should say it was dangerous for his ego. It was the father's kisses that shattered his arrogant illusion, right? You see, holy kisses are grace, and unholy kisses are an arrogant illusion, the product of the ego. 
Holy kisses give life, and unholy kisses simply consume life. They, they take life. Unholy kisses are, are dangerous to the kisser and to the kiss because they take life, which tempts everyone to hide their own life in an ego, which can no longer offer kisses or receive kisses. And yet, starving for kisses, we try even harder to take kisses, which means that we can no longer receive kisses for we are convinced that all the kisses are unholy. If you've been wounded by an unholy kiss, then of course Paul's kissing command seems incredibly dangerous. And in a way, it is. But I want you to hear me really well on this one. You are not the only victim of an unholy kiss. In the Garden of Gethsemane, <laughs> Jesus was betrayed with a kiss. And I think it was maybe the most unholy of all kisses, the very definition of evil. And yet, Romans 12, 21, Jesus didn't return evil with evil. He conquered the evil with the good, and he is the good. He conquered the evil with, with himself. Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. And do you remember what Jesus said? Friend. He called him friend. See, I don't think he rejected the kiss, but somehow he absorbed that kiss and transformed that evil into something else entirely. The gospel of grace. Evil kissed the good, and the good received the kiss and conquered the evil. Jesus lifted his head on the tree and cried, Father, forgive them. And who's them? At least Judas, right? Maybe you. He cried, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And then he delivered up his spirit, his breath. That's the holiest of all kisses. Maybe this is the holy kiss. And you see, the Father has been kissing us all along, but we don't know his kiss until we've taken his kiss, consumed it, until we've taken his kiss and seen that he's always given his kiss, and so we surrender to the love that's revealed in that holy kiss. And maybe we are all the victims of unholy kisses, but we cannot be free of those kisses until we suffer those kisses with Jesus and forgive as we've been forgiven. Okay, a whole lot to unpack there, but this is what I'm saying. Holy kisses seem to be quite dangerous. Unholy kisses clearly are very dangerous, but no kisses is most dangerous because then each one of us is absolutely alone, and that's hell. Number four, a world without kisses is hell. I, I think most psychologists and sociologists would argue that as children who have never been kissed with holy kisses or never been able to receive holy kisses, it's those children that often grow up to inflict the most unholy kisses on others. Because, you see, God made us for intimate communion and if we don't receive that intimate communion, we'll try to take intimate communion in the most unholy of ways. And so it does make sense to me that St. Paul would prescribe the holy kiss to remedy the curse of unholy kisses, which plagues us all. Number four, a world without kisses is hell. Number five, holy kisses are a communion called life. Life. Fifteen years ago, I did not want to live anymore. I felt, and I know, I don't know if this is true, but this is how I felt. I felt like I had been betrayed by hundreds and hundreds of kisses. And we've all been there. We've all been there in some way. I mean, maybe it was the day that, you know, your friends wouldn't sit next to you on the bus in seventh grade because they watched your dad kiss you. Or the day you received the note the uh, notice, the, the papers about the divorce. Or maybe the day you woke up in the rehab unit <laughs> and realized you had utterly betrayed yourself and all your friends. 
15 years ago, we had just started this sanctuary, and yet my heart felt so wounded <laughs> that I just wanted to quit everything. I was sitting in church when I felt a puff of air on my neck, and I, and I thought that was weird. <laughs> I don't know what that was. It happened several times, this puffing. The next week, I was preaching on the Song of Solomons. I remember the text was Song of Solomons 4.16, uh, and I, I looked up the literal translation, and this is what it, it literally translated how it read. Awake, O north wind, come, O south wind, or ruach, and, and puff upon my garden. The puffing happened for several months during, during the services. Sometimes barely perceptible, sometimes quite strong. I mean, no kidding. I remember one time sitting in the front row and I watched my notes move. Like, it moved, it moved my notes. I remember thinking, what the hell, God? Are you puffing on me? Or am I just mentally ill and finally just losing it? I, I remember thinking, God, I could really use a bona fide raise the dead miracle right now and all I get is puffing. And yet, when it didn't happen, I remember I would wonder, maybe he's given up on me. One night at our Sunday night service, October 2009, it was just silly. I mean, it was like happening all over my body, and I couldn't help but just laugh. And I remember I turned to Susan, and she handed me this piece of paper. It was what she had just heard the Lord say. Peter, I have never stopped kissing you. Sometimes my kisses are sweet. Sometimes they burn. But believe this, my kisses never stop. I love you. So number six, kisses can burn. You may remember in Dostoevsky's The Myth of the Grand Inquisitor, um, Jesus returns to earth during the Spanish Inquisition. He's imprisoned in Seville, Spain the grand, by the Grand Inquisitor. The Grand Inquisitor who accuses him of destroying the work of the church because Jesus desires this freedom for all the children of Adam. Uh, after um, this priest then just rails on Jesus sitting in this prison cell uh, with all of this brilliant and biting diatribe for pages and pages and the brothers Karamazov in the story. After he does all this, Jesus just stands up, walks across the prison cell, kisses the Grand Inquisitor on, quote, his old bloodless lips, and then Dostoevsky writes, and that is his only answer. The kiss glows in his heart. I imagine it burned. It burned like my father's kisses would burn me when he would drop me off in the seventh grade at Grand Junior High. It burned. But once our world has been reduced to ashes, you see, it no longer burns, and there could be nothing more sweet. So kisses can burn and kisses can be sweet. Number seven, kisses can destroy and kisses will create. 200 years ago, a young boy made a terrible mess with a set of paints. While his mother was away, he wasn't supposed to be painting, he was supposed to be watching his sister. When his mom came home early, he braced himself for the, for the judgment. Uh, the judgment of his mom, the wrath of his mom falling upon, upon him. But she just picked up the picture looked at the painting and said, what a beautiful painting of your sister. And then she kissed him on the cheek. Years later, Benjamin West, one of the greatest artists in our nation's history, Benjamin West would say, it was that kiss that made me a painter. You know, Paul was brutally honest in his letters to Corinth, and particularly Corinth, but also to Rome. <laughs> At times, they had really made a mess of things, but to make it all something beautiful would take far more than policies, rules, or a list of practical application points. It required a holy kiss, freely offered to all. Number eight, holy kisses are the judgment of God incarnate in human flesh. I stand by the bed where a young woman lies, writes Dr. Howard Seltzer. Her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, a tiny twig of the facial nerve, the one to the muscles of her mouth, has been severed. 
The surgeon had followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh. I promised you that. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor in her cheek, I had to cut the little nerve. Her young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to dwell in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Who are they, I ask myself? He and this wry mouth I have made, who gaze at and touch each other so generously, greedily. The young woman speaks. Will my mouth always be like this, she asks. Yes, I say, it will. It's because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. All at once, I know who he is. I understand it. I lower my gaze. One is not bold in an encounter with a god. Unmindful, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth, and I am so close I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate to hers, to show her that their kiss still works. That young bride had a wound in her body. I think sin is a wound in our soul. But our bridegroom bears our wounds to reveal the glory of his kiss. We crucified the holy kiss, and he let us crucify him in miracles of miracles. That's how the holy kiss works and works all things. It was that night in 2009 as Susan handed me that piece of paper that I last felt the, the puffing. But on the paper it was written, Peter, believe this, my kisses never stop. And so I try to make a habit. In fact, it's good that I preach this sermon because I dropped out of practice. But I try to make a habit of imagining what's true. Imagining him just kissing me. But it's easiest to imagine when I'm kissed by one of you or hugged by one of you or if you're a dude slapped on the back by one of you or just smiled at by one of you, especially when I don't deserve it, then you are the incarnation of the Father's constant kisses. Number nine, kisses bring us home. Tim Bailey rebelled against his father, broke his father's heart. Joe was a pastor. He tried everything to get through to his son, Tim. Nothing seemed to work. Tim left home. He joined a commune in downtown uh, Chicago. And you know what that probably was like, rather profligate living. Well, one night around 11 p.m., Joe got this, this call. This is the police. Your son was arrested for a DUI. We have him here in the town jail. Joe got out of his bed drove a half hour through the bitter cold to that town. And when he got to the town, he went into the, into the police office. They said, well, we have no Tim Bailey here. And so Joe, he thought, well, maybe I heard, heard wrong. And so he drove to the next town, and then the next town, and then the next town, and then the next town. Finally, around four in the morning, he decided to drive to that old house in downtown Chicago where he knew that Tim had been sleeping. The door wasn't locked. He stepped in over body after body looking for his son. And then in the faint light of the darkened room, he, he saw his boy sleeping in a sleeping bag just strewn across an old mattress. Quietly, he walked over the mattress, stood over his boy. And then without thinking, he just bent down and quietly kissed his son on the cheek. Got up, turned around and went home. In the months that followed, Tim started visiting his parents. He started even going to church with them. One day he said, well, I rededicated my life to Jesus, and then he announced that he planned to go to seminary and wanted to go into the, the ministry. One day, years later, on a walk, Joe turned to Tim and asked him, Tim, what brought you back? Tim stopped, looked at his dad and said, you don't know? <laughs> dad, 
Remember that night years ago when you got a call that I was in jail? That was one of my friends. That was a prank. When you came to the house, I only acted asleep. Dad, I was wide awake. But I knew that you had spent hours on that cold night driving throughout the state trying to find me. And I wonder what you would do to me when you did find me. And all you did was bend down and kiss me gently on the cheek. Dad, it was the kiss that brought me back. Number nine, kisses bring us home. Number 10, kisses are home. Number 11, kisses make all things new. I don't remember teaching my children this, so I think probably my children taught me this, but when they were little and they'd suffer some kind of wound, they'd come running to me, usually at church with a whole bunch of people all around, and they'd just be screaming, crying their heads off, Daddy, 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 I have a, I have an hour. Kiss it, kiss it, kiss it, Daddy. It was often embarrassing because they wouldn't stop crying and demanding, and sometimes they'd fallen on their bum, you know, and they're yelling, kiss it, kiss it, kiss it. So I'd pick them up, give them a, a little kiss, set them down, and then they this was the crazy part to me, it blew my mind. They'd just run off laughing and giggling as if I had actually healed the wound. And you see, maybe I did. Life hurts. Did you notice that? <laughs> Nobody likes pain. But you know what makes it absolutely terrifying? Believing a lie. That God, our Father, cannot save. God, our Father, does not want to save. That God, our Father, is not able to save. That God is not all-powerful love for you all the time. And you see, I think that's the point of Romans. And that's why Paul's practical application point is greet one another with a holy kiss. Our Father actually does make all things new. Broken smiles, broken hearts, broken souls. And he does it with his holy kiss. Number 12, Jesus is the holy kiss. If you want to know, does he love you so? It's in his kiss. That's where it is. Oh, yeah. And so on the night that he was betrayed by all of us, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. So we invite you to come forward, take a piece of bread, and dip it in the cup. And now this is different this morning, but the blue cups are juice, okay? We're going back to the way we used to do it. The brown cups are wine, so you can dip it in either cup. If you would like um, the little, those sanitary cups, that's great too, and you can just grab one off of the stage, okay? But we invite you to, to come forward and tear off a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and touch it to your lips. That's the holy kiss. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons, bless. When George Wishart was executed in 1546 for preaching the gospel against the dictates of the Roman Catholic Church, his executioner paused for a moment, and, and Wishart bent over and 
kissed him on the cheek and said, this is a token that I forgive you. You see, you do not kiss people that you think your Father in Heaven hates and is planning to endlessly torture. You kiss people because you're convinced that your Father in Heaven endlessly loves them and kisses them and desires them. That's the Gospel right there on your kisser. And now, none of these people in this room are your executioner. You know what they are? They're the holy ones. That's what saints means. They've received the Lord's kiss. And so an obvious practical application point is that you would give them a holy kiss. And I have to tell you, I was kind of stressed about this sermon because I thought, well, this is really going to be awkward at the end. Freaking awkward. Probably the people watching online are going, glad I didn't go to church today. Um, <laughs> but people were already kissing me at the communion line. And that's cool. I mean, so I'm just, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you what I might do. And if I, you know, I know you well, I might just kiss you. Um, but if you don't know someone well, um, then maybe you could just say, hey, is it okay if I give you a kiss, if I greet you? Um, and also if they say, well, you know, I'm, uh, Lynn said this, we said, I, well, I'd, I'd like a hug. If they want a hug, give them a hug. The point is that you are affectionate towards the other people in this body, um, that um, you express the love that comes from our Father. And uh, that's how Jesus said that they will know you belong to me, by your love. So, uh, in Jesus' name, believe the gospel. And oh yeah, and if someone does give you, if you're, if you're stressed about this, forget about it. It's all about grace, okay? But believe the gospel, and then um, apply the gospel, in Jesus' name, amen.